Welcome to the Just for Laughs panel, the serious business of comedy writing. How's everybody doing? By round of applause, let's get some energy going up in this piece. Awesome, legit. Um, I'm going to introduce the two panels we have today. Uh, we are very blessed and very fortunate to have them in our midst. Uh, one of them is my brother, seated to my right. Yes, that's, uh, you may remember him from the LGBT panel that just took place. Yes, such hits as the LGBT panel. He is the author of the novel Blue Boy, which is, it's the same color as his book. That's so funny, Blue Boy, Blue Man, Blue. Yeah, you can hold that up, uh, that's your cue. Um, it is a gender-bending comedy about a queer Indian American boy who thinks that he may be the reincarnation of Lord Krishna. It was the winner of the Lambda Award and the Prose Poetry Award from the Association of Asian American Studies and is now taught at high schools and colleges worldwide. Satyal also earned, that's Rakesh Satyal, also earned a 2010 fellowship in fiction from the New York Foundation for the Arts. That sounds made up, is that a real thing? It it's a real thing, thing. okay. Um, his short stories and essays have been widely anthologized and, and he has been, he's been writing about pop culture in a variety of places and he has been covered in Out Magazine, New York Magazine, Page Six, etc. For 10 years he was a book editor, first at Random House and then at HarperCollins and he has worked with a wide variety of best-selling authors and debut novelists. Please welcome Rakesh Satyal. I was deciding what order, in what order to go in. What's the, you know, but you end with a punchline, I feel like, so this is a better. Uh, he is a correspondent on is, not was, he's still there, a correspondent on Comedy Central's The Daily Show with Jon Stewart. As a writer, he is a recipient of the 1999 Obie Award, that sounds real, for his critically acclaimed play, Sakina's Restaurant, which was later adapted and made into a movie called Today's Special. Some of his theater credits include the Broadway revival of Oklahoma, factorial, oh, that's an exclamation point, as well as home, that's a little mouth humor, Homebody, Kabul, Suburbia, and Disgraced. His film credits include Premium Rush, The Proposal, The Last Airbender, the Internship and Million Dollar Arm, which is now playing on Delta Airlines. I saw that yeah. on the way here. Um, <laughs> his television credits include Jericho, Curb Your Enthusiasm, ER, Sleeper Cell, and HBO's upcoming The Brink, which he has written, co-produced, and not written the whole thing. Not written the whole thing. Not he, he's on the brink of writing on. <laughs> also serving as writer and producer. He lives and works in the greatest city in the world, New York City. Please welcome Asif Manvi. Asif Manvi, everybody. And he has his book called No Lands Man. Same color as my brother's book. Well, and, his, and I did a one-person show called No Man's Land. So we are very intricately, and the coffee was supplied by my other brother. So there, there's a whole thing here. It's uh, actually tea. So. It's a family affair. It's a uh, sl uh, sly in the family stone. Good. You're welcome to join. And, and my mom is sitting there too. So um, we're just missing our dad. This is amazing. You're the only one with hair. Yeah, <laughs> yeah that's correct. And our mom. Yeah, that's, that's, yeah, that's the only too. So these guys, speaking of hair and hats, uh, they, are, they are actually wearing hats, and they wear many hats. Uh, they are authors, actors, writers, right? You don't even have to edit that. That was good, right? So, all right. <laughs> so I feel like we are well equipped to talk about comedy writing, uh, stand-up, improv, sketch, uh, lots of different things. And uh, what I'm gonna do is I've got a series of questions but in panels that we've watched today and yes, uh, yesterday and today, uh, sometimes the moderator is leading, sometimes following. I would like to follow. I think I'd like to see where the conversation goes. Uh, we don't have an objective as such, but we're going to probably do about, we want to split it uh, according to uh, probably what's appropriate. So a balance of my asking the questions, and then we're going to turn the last 30 seconds over to you so you could ask questions. So, uh, but no, we'll, we'll, we'll include, because we got asked some funny questions in San Francisco. Uh, yeah. I interviewed Asif at the Jewish Cultural Center in San Francisco. Right. And the best question was, let's start at the beginning. Were you born yeah, you, you vaginally or C-section? Take back. I was neither. 
I don't even know how that you just how that it's a test tuber. Okay, me too. That's a very <laughs> very clever one. And uh, somebody also asked you how would your life be different if you were Jewish? Yes. <laughs> and, and the answer is I could make fun of Jews. That's right. That would be great. That's a good answer. So nailed it. Two in a row. So that that is definitely good. Okay. So I'm going to direct these questions to both of you, but. Um, Every now and then there'll be one directed to one of you, but jump in as, as needed. Um, let's start at the origin. Um, a friend of mine who, uh, who creates characters for a living says that her characters start with a voice. I was like, how do you create a character? She goes, I just start doing a voice around the house, and then I come up with a backstory and a point of view and all these things. As a stand-up, I don't look for what's funny, because you've seen my act, because it's not really that funny. Yeah. Uh, I don't look for what's funny. I look for what's different and very and incongruous, and then we, then comics go from there. Um, what about you as writers? How do you decide to write something? Do you decide you have a message to get across? Is it, is it a theme? Is it characters? How does it start? His book is structured as kind of vignettes that are told, and they're kind of uh, like kind of isolated stories that, uh, as a whole, create create the larger structure. So I'm I'm actually really intrigued to know how you chose those two, like how you decided what you were going to. Um, I actually, uh, it's 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 a process that is doesn't have a real sort of method per se. I always start with a method and then throw it out. I mean, most of the time when I write, I sort of write something that I feel strongly. Well, okay, it starts with something that I think is interesting, like like you said, or different, or unique, or something that I think people will find interesting. And then out of that, I try to come up with a theme that I want to talk about, and something larger than just the story or the thing itself. And then at some point, that theme gets thrown away, and it sort of starts to like take on a life of its own, and it just becomes the thing. And I never really think about writing something, spe especially with storytelling. I never think about like, oh, I have to write something funny. I just think of like, this is an idea. And then as I write it, the sort of, the things that make me laugh about it emerge. And out of that, sometimes jokes come out of it. Sometimes just situational stuff that's just funny sort of develops, but it's very, Usually I, I, I write and then I, I go back and I start from the beginning again and then I write more. And then I go back to the beginning and I write a little bit more. So it's sort of like I keep building on what, it, but I keep changing everything also based on what I just wrote. So it's sort of a, a process of like, it, so it's, 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 it's iterative in a way. Yeah, it's very Hindu. It's destroying and recreating, destroying <laughs> and recreating, you know? And so, um, yeah, it, it's, and then out of that, I don't, organically things occur to me that are funny, and then those things will make me laugh. And I don't always know if it is funny, I just know that I'm, I'm amused by myself. So you're, you're, you're the audience, are you, you're sort of, if you, if that's the litmus test? I mean, that's yeah. the moment of truth. I mean, I think with, I think with something like a book, you are the only, uh, you know, you and your editor are the only two people that can, you know, and sometimes my editor has told me to like cut things that I'm like, no, that's hilarious. I am not cutting that. That is the funniest line in the book, you know, and then, um, and, and so sometimes you kind of just know what's funny and, 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 but you have to trust your own instinct with something when you're performing or you're doing stand up or like when I did my one man show, you have the benefit of taking it out and doing it for an audience and they will tell you what is funny. So when you do a reading, because you both have done readings, do, will you change the delivery of it, the wording of it, the content of it based on the reactions that you get? Um, not the content, but definitely, um, you know, there's, you can gauge what an audience, what an audience's personality is like, and you can cater to that somewhat, you know. Uh, it's in the way that you read it. I mean, with a story, if I'm reading a story, I won't change the content. But if I'm doing just something more free form or something, then yes, then I will realize like, oh, this audience really wants more sort of hard hitting kind of, they want the, they want the dirty gritty stuff, you know, and then this audience, another audience is a little bit more cerebral and they like the sort of smart comedy aspect of it. So, you know, you, you just, it's just about playing. It's like, it's like a musician. You just sort of raise the bass or the treble or whatever, you know. Would you agree with that and have, have your um, readings informed your work and how do you use readings in public sort of 
discourse and, and dialogue to reinforce what you do? Um, well, first of all, the one word that comes to mind from what you're talking about is palimpsest. You know, when it looks kind of an ancient thing of having a lot of texts that are kind of written over each other, which is kind of, but exactly, exactly. <laughs> but I, uh, but uh, I, I, well, I, I actually have a very kind of like uh, strong view on this because having been a book editor for a long time, I would tell my authors like, People go to a reading to have an experience. They don't go to really hear you read. They go to see who you are and the, the inflection that you give something. This is actually a point I was making early on the earlier panel, which is advice I often gave writers um, when I was working as an editor, which is that, so assuming that you have a, a kind of base of education in terms of you've studied the mechanics of writing, you've studied uh, the kind of particulars of writing or how to tell a story, then your job is really just to tell the story, is to tell like literally the details of what happened in the story. Because as Asif saying, when you, if you have that, the way that you tell that story is going to be inimitable to you. So if we all left this room today and we told people what happened this afternoon, it would be done in a way that's very particular to who we are as individuals. So that's one of the reasons why his book works really well is that he's chosen these stories to tell and they're structured in a certain way where he's just telling the story, but then the details come out in the voice that he's creating for it. So I think when people come to see you read, oftentimes that's what they're coming for. They're coming to see the way in which you're telling the story. A lot of people will zone out and they actually, most people don't even pay attention to a reading when you're when you're at, past like minute five at, at, at the least, people are not paying attention anymore. So what they're, there for is the, the experience that you're giving them. They're tweeting about. They're it. tweeting about, yeah. <laughs> and so, um, but that's why that's why typically when I do book readings, I typically sing at them because I do a cabaret show, and I feel like that's the something extra that people are coming for. They're coming to see who I am as a person, not really just what I wrote in a book. And now, from the Little Mermaid, part of your world. <laughs> exactly. I'm kidding. I'm kidding. So how do you decide, uh, you structured your book uh, as a series of sort of essays and autobiographical, largely chronological. How do you decide, uh, okay, so as comedians, we can create a sketch, we could make a satire, we could make an autobiography, we could make a t-shirt, we could make a lot of different things. How did you decide to structure it that way and, w and does form lead function? Does it sort of take a shape of, oh, I'm writing an autobiography, oh, I'm writing a novel that is semi-autobiographical. How does that go? Bless you. Um, I... You, you know, for me, it was, it was, I just had this, I just started writing stories. And then in the same way that I constructed Sakina's Restaurant, um, first I started just writing individual stories and then started to see patterns emerging in those stories. And that's what then informed the structure. Like then I sort of thought, oh, okay, there's, there's stories about my childhood in England and then there's stories about like, my adolescence in high school in Florida and then New York and, you know, career and all that. So it sort of started to feel, as I was writing them, organically. And I didn't write them chronologically, but they started to organically feel a chronology to it, you know. And then it was just about c putting it into a structure. And then I created, and then this, this train journey that I have in the book that sort of, uh, you know, book, book, marks the the different sections so that for me was just more like i just i just throw things up against a, a board as it were and then see what the patterns emerge and then try to like sort of like fo you know focus that so with your novel because that has an arc to it do you know the ending well this is that's a good question because when i wrote this they're, book they're all good questions yeah, they're, they're all very good questions <laughs> uh but when i wrote this book i actually had a very firm idea of how what would happen in it. And it's funny because sometimes people will say, oh, I started writing something that it became, took on a life of its own and it went somewhere completely different. And that's not at all what happened with this book. It was like I had a very firm idea of what I wanted to have happen. Now, with the book I'm working on now, which I'm finishing this fall, uh, I began with the idea of a per like a person. I, got, I was kind of fascinated by a character I was writing and I thought it would just be a short story and then it kind of ballooned into this larger book. And I've done myself a great disservice in working on this because I get very lazy as a writer and I start writing one section and then I'm just like, oh, I want to do this section. And I started writing out of order and it made it hell for me when I went back to actually piece it together because I couldn't even remember where I had left off a lot of the things I was working on. So that is very, I, I've learned a very valuable lesson for when I work on my next book, which is that I think doing the groundwork and doing what he's talking about in terms of putting the ideas up there and seeing what you got and figuring that all out first. I'm not saying you write an exact outline 
line and know exactly what's going to happen. But having a firm idea of that makes it the process a lot more efficient, not, not just efficient, but effective. If you actually go through it and think, okay, now this is the way I'm structuring it. Now I'll write it and I know the details in my head. And I know, you know, like you should always know what your character's shoe size is. Like if you can't answer that question, you haven't done enough thinking about what you're actually trying to write. So it's that kind of thing where that now I realize that structure is going to lead me a lot. It, I don't have to be a slave to it, but it will be a guiding principle. So let's get granular. Let's talk about um, your process itself. Are you in a room with a whiteboard? Because I love a whiteboard. I love to actually pull out a pen and a paper. Are you typing on a on an iPhone? Or are you typing on an iPad? Are you where are you and when is this happening? And what is your shoe size and all that? Um, <laughs> Uh, I can't talk about my shoe size. Um, so uh, but you know what they say. Um, so, uh, so I. It depends on what I'm writing. It depends on you know. I, I, I mean, I, I I do agree. I I think that the outline, especially if you're writing a long form thing, if you're writing a screenplay or you're writing a novel or something you for me it is helpful to know what the ending is because you, you kind of know where at least you're going you know and, and so even if you get lost you know that like at least the the horizon is that you know um but but it is kind of you know look i, I i've been um in terms of screenplay writing or playwriting or whatever like i i will i will often have a structure and then Within that structure, I will go to different places within that structure and write out of order, you know, but then and then try to connect it back into the structure. But that structure, at least very even if it's very loose, even if it's just like a, a, a sketch of a structure of where you kind of want to go, then it allows you the freedom to go like to do exactly what you said, which is like I, I want to write. I'm writing the beginning, but like, you know, but but there's something there's a scene here though, or there's a story here that I want to tell, which is like and then you come back and you're like, oh, then connect those two things. You know what I mean? But you, but at least if you have that structure, you know, uh, kind of what road where the road is going, you know. And where are these things living? Are they printed out? Are they, because I'm just trying to get down to for writers who like, where where are you, connect? like when I think of building a house, there's a structure that has to take place. But it sounds like you guys maybe on one day you want to lay down the foundation, then you want to do the windows, and then one day you want to pick out the curtains. Yeah, I, I mean, I'm a big fan. I always recommend to people Stephen King's book on writing, which I think is a really wonderful guide for people. Um, and he goes into the actual like particulars of what he thinks people should do when they write, and I kind of agree with all of them, which is that one of the big things he tells people, which was very helpful to me, is that you should always write at a, wherever you're writing, or desk where you are, that does not have a window near it. Because people think that they sit in front of a window and they'll get inspiration from what's outside. And in truth, you should be getting inspiration from what's inside. So when you have something, you're, it's actually distracting to have something that you're looking at and doing that. So typically I do try to go somewhere and I do work at a computer. I, I, I don't know if I've ever written longhand just because of like the generation I'm in. I just, I write on a, at a computer. And, um, but I do try to do that. And, and, and what he, what a lot of people will say, a lot of editors will recommend this, a lot of, is that write a thousand words a day, which is a pretty sizable chunk of writing, but isn't that much writing. It's like three and a half double space pages basically so but that the idea that if you train yourself to do that then actually what if you do that for three months say you have a 90,000 word novel and that's a whole book and like if you have the discipline to do that so that is typically I I do try to stand by that as much as I possibly can the, the thing that you have to keep in mind is that you know at this point this book I'm writing is probably something like 120,000 words and I I know I have to cut at least 20,000 of those words, if not more. There's just raw material when you get to the end of a first draft that you have to get rid of. But it is th those are the mechanics of typically how I do it. And Louis C.K. also said that he writes on a computer that has no ability to get on the internet. Yeah. He said that was another thing, is make sure oh, it's something that yes. is disconnected yes. from the internet at all times. Yes. So as actors, uh, or auditioners as the case may be, um, do we, uh, when, they give, when they give you a script, not in your case, but anyway, when you're on... Um, when you're given a script, oftentimes they tell us, you know, don't ask what's funny about this. Ask what the writers ask what the writers are making fun of. Mm -hmm. So in other words, if you go in like, oh, I'm going to make this funny, it's not as funny as if you find what the joke is. So do you find that you your jokes and your have certain themes, have certain victims, have certain whatever? Is there a type of comedy that you feel like you write? Um, well, having having been on The Daily Show for several years now, I think that I do sort of enjoy writing comedy that is 
that has a social uh, or cultural aspect to it. You know, like like um, uh, pointing out like like the stuff we do on the Daily Show, which is basically like pointing out the absurdity of like you know. Republicans, uh, Republicans. <laughs> or, or or just cultural stuff. You know what I mean? Like 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 I think that that is a it's a place where I sort of live is in that space between cultures and stuff and you know many people in this room do as well and so that fit for me feels like it's the fodder for where my comedy will always sort of come from I think family is another place where comedy can always come from and those those are places that I feel like I end up go, you know I use my parents as like for everything I do you know they're my they are my raw material in a lot of cases, you know, the, I, I had an acting teacher tell me once that we, I took a, a class in college called clown class, and uh, it was basically it wasn't like Ringling Brothers, Barnum and Bailey kind of clowns. It was more sort of um, Charlie Chaplin, kind of creating your own clown, right? And um, it was invariably he said that whenever I've done this class, everybody's clown is an exaggeration of one or both of their parents. Mm -hmm. Um, is a ver is a sort of distorted version of one of our both, both of the parents. <laughs> um, <laughs> when you do your mother, it's great. When you do, <laughs> uh, um, but uh, but it's true, you know. Like I think that so my parents have always been a source of a source of raw material for me. Like the stuff that they do, the stuff that they say, the stuff that they've gone through. Uh, for me, is always you know as as an immigrant and all that is is very much where I where I go to. So in your book, um, it states in the very beginning, at the, at the very top, uh, without giving it away, this is on the first, uh, first couple of pages, although the stories in this book are based on true events, the specific circumstances are often a blend of fact and imagination. How often? How uh, do you reconcile this with the statement that which is most personal is most general? Like, do you just go in, like we were talking about just the inspiration of going in, or are you trying to tell a broader story, and then how do you figure out what should lead? Is it the truth? Well, I think that, I think that everything, like I say in that, in that statement, you know, like I go into the personal. I go into the place of like, this is true. The kernel of this really did happen. This happened. Then you have to figure out how to tell a story. And, you know, Aristotle said, art is not life, it is other, right? So, um, damn right, I dropped the Aristotle. That's right. <laughs> I thought you said right like we know. It's like he did say that, right? In the poetics, which is for next door. Um, it was Socratic because it ended with a question. So, um, but he, you know, so so then you have to figure out what the story is that you're telling, which is not always um, what really happened, or in the way that it really happened. You know, you because you're trying to because then you want to talk about larger themes. You want to like. A, you want to take the specifics and the personal and then somehow extrapolate that into larger ideas that you might want to share with people, you know. Um, so anything can make a story, you know. Like my trip to the coffee shop can make a story. It's just what you do with that event and how you, uh, what, what, what you say about that and what you take away from it and what you inject into it to, 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 to make larger resonances and points, I guess. I was particularly privy to this with Blue Boy, of course, because I grew up with you, or, or so I thought. Uh, and how much of it was true? How much of mom's makeup did you really try on? Um, uh, but yeah, that, yeah that, that's the question you were gonna ask. Um, well, no, because when I, when I made my one-man show, I, I did think about that. I was like, there are times where I'm like, this is not my story to tell. This is my ex-girlfriends, this is my parents, this is my brother's story, this isn't my story. How did you find that line? What is fair game and, you know, what is not? I think in a way, um, when I first started working on it, I mean, I, I tell people typically that this book actually, it hues closer to my own life at the beginning and then it spreads out and changes, which is very true of it. I think in a way, writing it was sort of a bloodletting for me because I was writing it at a time when I was still like coming into terms of being like a gay man living in New York and like now reflecting on my childhood. What does that mean? And so... As I was working on it, I think you and Vikas, our other brother, know this, but I began the book actually writing it with the main character having two brothers. I actually was thinking that would center it in a certain way, and I would show to kind of depict the differences among them so you could see what was happening with the main character who's queer. And I realized pretty soon into the process that wasn't going to work because I really did have to focus it on what was happening with him and not dilute that by 
shifting focus to the other red members of the family. Another notable difference is that the mother in the family is doesn't work and she stays at home. And, and those were changes I had to make because I started to realize like there's this very specific story that I'm trying to tell here. And the way I'm shifting these things is going to throw certain characters into relief as a result of, of shifting those things. So, um, you know, it's funny when you were talking about your acting class because one story I always love telling is that there's a very famous story, I guess, about Marlon Brando when he was studying with Stella Adler, which is that Stella Adler would give the students an exercise where she would tell them to be behave like they were a field full of chickens. So they would all have to walk around pretending they were chickens. And then she would tell them, um, you know, uh, okay, a, a bomb is being dropped upon you. So now act that. And all the students went scurrying around, freaking out like crazy. Marlon Brando was just sitting in the middle of the room. So she went up to him and she said, you know, what are you doing? And he goes, I'm a chicken. What do I know from a bomb? You know, which is and that's when she realized that what, he, what a kind of genius he was because he had actually tapped into something really human about what was happening there. So I think, yeah, or chickeny, or po very, very po poultry-ish. Mm -hmm. But, uh, but the, the idea there too that's is at least, foul. yeah, it's just foul. But, um, <laughs> but the thing that, the, the, the point I'm making in a sense is that you have to kind of also sort of know what your characters know and know what the story is supposed to be telling, you know, because if they're specific, that's that's what I was trying to do there. It was like, okay, now when I take a step back, what do the parents actually know versus what we think they know? What does he know about himself that he thinks he knows about himself that he doesn't necessarily know about himself? So those things start to shift, and that's how playing with structure in that way and playing with the facts of the story actually help bring those things into life. Mm -hmm.